Hey guys, and welcome back to another Lost Bits video right here on Tetrabit Gaming, the series where we explore the unused, altered, and unseen content in gaming. So as I make this video, it's been about, uh, six years since the last time I've covered a Mario RPG on this series. And with the Super Mario RPG Remake finally coming out soon here, I decided to take things all the way back to the 1996 original for the Super Nintendo. Honestly, I'm still shocked we're getting this game remade at all. Anyways, with all that said, we got lots to go through here. So stomp on that like button below, it's time to check out some Super Mario RPG Lost Bits. Alright, so first let's kick things off with a whole bunch of unused items, weapons, and other objects. As far as the weapons go, we first got some unused color variants of the Troopa Shell, Knock Knock Shell, as well as the bigger Lazy Shell. For the Knock Knock Shell that usually only appears in green, there are these unused red and orangey versions of it, and then similarly for both the Troopa and Lazy Shells, which are normally seen only in red, there are also unused green and orange variants of them too. It's currently unclear why these other colors were cut from the game, but some have theorized that since Mario uses the red shells, the green, lazy, and Troopa shells might have been from a point in the game's development where Luigi was planned to be in the game and would have his own color-coded shells. It's of course pure speculation, but I guess it would make at least a bit of sense. And then there are actually quite a few additional instances of unused alternate color palettes for some items, and these include an unused blue and red version of the game's hammer, and it's been theorized that these may have been intended to either have been for visually differentiating the different hammers in the game, or perhaps once intended to be fire and ice elemental hammers. And furthermore, there are also unused color palettes for several items, including the Able Juice, Energizer, Bracer, Freshen Up, Mega Elixir, Power Blast, Pick Me Up, Yoshi Candy, and more. Now, there are some items in the game that are seen in all four of these colors, which make for a pretty slick logo, might I add. So it's entirely likely that the different color palettes for all of these items were made to easily implement different levels of each as items if need be. And we can kinda see this with the elixirs and mushrooms, where with the mushrooms for example, although this blue palette was never used, the red, green, and yellow ones were seen in the game as the regular, mid, and max mushrooms respectively. And while we're on the topic of unused color palettes, there's also this unused silver set of graphics for Molo's symbols, which normally appear gold, and then, even more interesting, is that there are actually palettes left in the game for different colors of the teleportation graphics used by the Axum Rangers. So yeah, instead of them all just having a red teleportation graphic as is seen in the game, it looks like there were at least some plans for each of them to use their respective color, which obviously would have fit the characters much better. Now next up, although there aren't any graphics for these, there are actually quite a few unused items left over in the game. Now I say unused like that because these all seem to be more so items used by the developers for testing this game rather than scrapped items that were ever actually meant to be properly implemented. Anyways, these unused items are all listed as bombs, and these include a debug bomb that damages all enemies by 255 points by default, Bane Bomb, which will actually inflict poison on a selected member of your own team. The Doom Bomb will similarly self-inflict a default 255 points of damage. Fear, Sleep, and Mute Bombs would cause the user to gain the Fear Effect, Fall Asleep, or get muted respectively. And finally, just Bomb can directly deal 255 points of damage to a single selected enemy. Then next up, there are also a few objects left over in the game that go unused. First up, there's an unused version of the Mario doll that's seen in the game, and although it's kind of hard to tell them apart since the graphics are so small, the unused version appears to basically just be a shrunken version of Mario's normal sprite, while the one that did go on to be used appears more like a toy. So it's likely that the early version was just used as a placeholder until the updated graphics were implemented. And speaking of placeholder graphics, there's also this red plus graphic that's a generic placeholder and we'll actually see more of it when we get to talking about this game's debug menu later on in this video. Then we got not one, but two sets of unused number graphics, including this one that looks quite similar to the number font type that's used in the UI graphics during a battle. And in fact, they can actually be loaded back into the game so we can see how they would look. Then we have this unused graphic of a banana peel that looks similar to how they're seen in Mario Kart games, and it's believed that this may have been intended to be used when chasing Booster in Booster Hill. Then we have this set of graphics lacking a proper color palette that appear to depict a shy guy sitting, jumping, as well as getting absolutely bonked. And then between these there's also a star and what looks like a mushroom. 
Now what makes these extra interesting is that their art style is quite different than the rest of the game, suggesting that these may have been made earlier on in developing Super Mario RPG when the game had a different look to it. Then next we have this unused left-facing Bellome statue from Bellome Temple. These flowers that go unused likely meant for Merrymore as they're found amongst its other graphics. There's this set of sideways facing pipe ends that were meant to be seen on walls. We got an early version of the sunken ship where not only is it facing in a different direction than how it's seen in the game, but also it's seen as a full graphic instead of just its sails, mast, and crow's nest being present, which here also has the beam sticking up so it doesn't appear like a warp pipe entrance as it does in the final. Now some have speculated that this suggests that originally there might have been a different way of entering the ship rather than entering it from the top like this. Then other unused graphics include this one featuring a bandana shark with an incorrect color palette as well as obviously some developer notes specifying something being 30. There's this set of graphics for a hollow sign and these were actually seen in some early screenshots of this game where they were seen used in Nimbus Land. There are these graphics that look to have been part of a cave tile set. Some early versions of the trophy pedestal seen in Nimbus Castle. There's an early, more curved version of the blackjack table seen in Great Guy's Casino. We got this unused basic looking cloud graphic with only a pair of dots for eyes. And then even more basic looking is this crude programmer art graphic of uh, a Mario themed Pokeball. Yeah, I don't know. It's currently unclear what this was designed for or where it would have went, but if you have any ideas, I'd love to hear them in the comments. Then, in addition to all of those, there are also unused object sprites left in the game that reveal a few also unused animations for which they would have been used for. And these include this effect of a spider web expanding as a battle effect, likely meant for the two spider themed enemies in the game, Spinthra or Arachne, a sort of similar looking gold battle effect that has an unknown purpose but has been theorized to maybe have been part of Molo's symbol attacks. And then there are also graphics for an animation of these flowers happily dancing, unlike their completely motionless versions that are normally seen in the Yoster Isle part of the game's ending cutscene. And while we're talking about unused animations, let's now switch gears and start talking about the game's enemies and NPCs, and first take a look at some of their unused graphics and animations. For these, we have this unused sprite of the Carabossus enemy, these unused graphics for a pair of unused Elder Toads that were apparently meant to be used in Rose Town when you first enter it as Bowyer's arrows are raining down. There are unused graphics for an animation of Todovsky, the conductor scene in Tadpole Pond, actually conducting. There is an unused animation of a Lakitu pumping something up, a different bouncing animation for the Shyster Shy Guy variant. For Exor, there are unused animations for both of his eyes looking either to the left or to the right. There is an unused attack animation for the Luko enemy, which goes unused since they never do any physical attacks and only magic ones. There is this unused animation for Tsar Dragon meant for him charging up. Then we also have a few more unused graphics and animations for Smithy, including this animation for his head in tank form that's thought to be for him casting a spell, as well as we have this small version of his head which is actually used as part of the head's transformation animation, but it's never normally seen as the graphic is blocked by the beam of light at the moment. Then we also have this animation of Gino after he bumps his head which is never seen from this angle. And then finally we have some unused animations of Peach sitting and crying. The first of these has Peach crying, and then towards the end of the animation she kinda shakes, and this is actually partially used, as the first frame of this animation is seen during Peach and Booster's wedding in the game. However, this animation was actually planned to be used in the cutscene when Mario first arrives at Booster Tower, and this is actually confirmed as there's an unused cutscene left over in the game where it can be seen. And in addition to this animation being used in that early cutscene, instead of Peach standing and crying as is seen in the final version of it, overall it's slightly different too with some different dialogue. Here's the cutscenes back to back.
Then furthermore, the second cutscene in this area also has an early version of it left over with a few more differences, most notably again featuring some different dialogue. Anyways, there's actually this second unused crying animation of Peach where she seems to be fake crying as at the end of the animation, she opens one of her eyes as if to check if someone is buying her act. And unlike the first crying animation, it's not currently 100% clear where this one was planned to be used. Now next, while we're talking about enemies and NPCs and such, as it turns out, Seaside Town is actually found in the same map as the outside of Great Guy Casino. And if you load into this map via the casino area but hack your way over to the Seaside Town section, you can actually find some pretty interesting, otherwise unused NPC behavior. First, we can see Gino here pacing back and forth and will want to get the show on the road if you chat with him. There are two Terrapins here walking in place and oddly enough touching them will result in a battle against two Goombas where extra oddly, the battle reverts to taking place in the Mushroom Kingdom. And then last, but absolutely not least, there's also this toad here, who will just... float up and down. Yeah. And interacting with this toad will reveal that he has the same text response as Gino here. A pretty weird area, but I guess a cool mini reward, if you want to call it that, for players that got to this area in an unintended way. So we talked about a few unused enemy graphics, but those are for the enemies that are seen in the game, and there are actually quite a few enemy types left over in the game that are straight up just never used. Now, much like some of the items I covered earlier, a bunch of these unused enemy types are just alternate palettes of enemies in the game, including Crippo, which was meant to be a stronger version of Hopapo. There's Harlequin, Drillbit, who is seen in a cutscene during the first battle against Smithy, but is never actually encounterable in battle. Lumbler, Juju, Mastablasta, Pile Driver, a separate Pile Driver body enemy type, a ghostly Radish that would have been an alternate version of Carabossus, a purple Bahamut, Chompweeds, which although they're seen in the game as an overworld hazard in the Pipe Vault area, there is battle enemy data for them that means at one point there were plans to allow the player to actually fight them. There's a yellow version of the Gun Yoke, an unused super version of the Spike enemy, and many, many, many more unused color variants of various different enemy types. There's also Baba Yaga, who is a color swap of Fauzo, and interestingly enough, despite never normally being encounterable in the game, Baba Yaga here actually appeared on the back cover of the Nintendo Power Strategy Guide for this game. Then there's also this unused enemy that appears as a garbled mess of numbers and letters, basically this game's version of Missing No from Pokemon. Now of course, this enemy wasn't intended to look like this, but based on this animation data that's also left over for it in the game, it appears to match up with a scrapped enemy seen in some pre-release screenshots of the game, as well as some conceptual artwork, and this would have apparently been a large cactus fella with a pacifier in its mouth known as Sabon. Also apparently, this enemy could spawn in also scrapped mini enemy versions of itself known as Boten and their names derive from Saboten, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, the Japanese word for cactus, go figure. Then next, although there's no battle data or graphics for them, there's this normally unseen graphic of a sea urchin enemy. And I say normally unseen rather than unused, since as found by my pal She Says from Boundary Break a few years ago, these urchins are actually loaded outside of normal view in the section of the game where Mario has to collect Peach's things for the marriage with Booster. And although they're loaded in here, it's probably more likely that they were originally meant to be seen in the sea or sunken ship parts of the game, as yeah, they would just seem to fit there a lot better. And the unused enemy data doesn't end there, as there are actually several enemy attacks left over in the game that never get used. These include a chainsaw move that would have been the same as the corona move, toxicist which would poison your party, Knockout, which would be completely broken as it would deal a whopping 9,999 damage to your whole team. 
There's a scrapped royal flush move that just based on its name was likely meant to be a third and stronger version of the full house and wild card moves used by the Jester, and this move would have dealt 8 times normal attack damage. Then there's Sickle, which would have turned a character into a Scarecrow and would deal 1.5 times normal damage, as well as finally a Dahlia Dance move that would turn a character into a Mushroom. Nice. Then, although not tied to any attacks or anything, there's actually an unused status ailment left over in the game, where once a character gets affected by it, it will start attacking random targets, both enemy and friendly. And if you've ever played a Pokemon game, this is basically like your Pokemon getting confused in those games. So it feels like it's been a hot minute since I went over some unused text here on the series, but we're fixing that right now for all of you unused text fans out there, as this game actually has a fair bit of them. First, there are some unused messages normally revealed when using Molo's Psychopath move, and these are all normally unused, since these enemies are only fought BEFORE you unlock having Molo as part of your party. At the start of the game, Bowser would think, Mario, it's time. The Hammer Brothers would just keep thinking about how much they love their hammers, and the Terrapins would think, yo, what's going on? Which could reference their low visibility through their helmets. Then some other unused bits of text include dialogue with the Chancellor after telling him that Peach was kidnapped, an unused bit of dialogue from Smithy that was to be used when defeating his first phase, there's uh, this bit of dialogue, which it isn't 100% certain who it was to come from, but it's believed that it was meant for Valentina. And then there's this message, for a party member's max HP increasing by a certain value. Now moving along, Super Mario RPG actually has quite a few unused maps and backgrounds left over in the game. For the battle backgrounds, we have two unused ones, the first being a cool looking underwater place, most likely meant for the area where you enter the sunken ship. And then secondly, there's this jungle area that apparently appears to be based on a background type from Yoshi's Island. And with these windows appearing here, some have speculated that this might have been related with Nimbus Castle, but just based on how it looks, I think it's more likely that this might have been intended for the forest maze. Then, as far as unused overworld maps go, there's actually a mix of maps that still have their proper tile graphics intact, some that only have collision maps remaining, and some, uh, somewhere in between. So these unused maps include an early version of Melody Bay, then, although left over garbled up like this now, this is the tile arrangement that was meant for the original design of Bowser's Keep as it was seen in this pre-release screenshot of the game. Then similarly, there's this mountain area, this basic grassland area, as well as an old version of the Mushroom Kingdom area, all of which were also seen in early screenshots. And for the early Mushroom Kingdom area, the layout is different, as are the buildings and castle itself. There's also this arch here that was removed in the final version, and this early version only has one entrance or exit, unlike the final version, which has both an entrance as well as an exit to Bandit's Way. Then also for the Mushroom Kingdom as it's seen in the final game, its collision map reveals that the area was once planned to be much larger as we can see collision data that extends far beyond where the castle is ultimately seen, which I thought was pretty cool. Then we got another unused grassland area, a messed up tile map that's apparently thought to be an earlier version of Mario's room. Then there's collision data for a scrapped town that looks to have been meant to be set in the mountains, and due to it bearing some resemblance to Moleville, it could have perhaps been an early version of that. Then there's collision maps for another mountain area, a dungeon area, as well as what appears to be an earlier room from Booster's Tower. Now what's extra interesting about the dungeon area is that it appears to have taken place in a scrapped section of the game seen in a pre-early screenshot, where at least both Mario and Peach would get captured and imprisoned in some dungeon together, and would presumably have to figure out a way to escape. Then next we got some unused layouts for the forest maze, Karo sewers, the interiors of town buildings, cave areas, as well as three whole sets of unused sections of Bowser's Keep the third of which uses a different tile set, suggesting that it may have been some sort of basement area, perhaps the one seen in this pre-release screenshot of the game. Now next up, there's a small grassy test map with a few raised platforms, part of a sign, as well as five exits. Just based on how simple this test room is, it's likely that this is from a much earlier stage of development when basic stuff like jumping, interacting with objects, and going through doors was being tested. 
Then lastly, similarly, there's an unused debug test room that's much more functional than the previous one. When loading into this map, a message will pop up instructing you that this is the world map and to go talk to a certain person to be taken to a place that you want to go. And just how it sounds, this map contains several toad NPCs here, most of which will warp you to a given area in the game, including Nimbus Land, Bean Valley, Monstro Town, Barrel Volcano, Land's End, and there's also a Bowser here who can fittingly take you to Bowser's Keep. And you probably noticed there's also a sprite of Mario here, but he just remains motionless and you can't really interact with him. There's also one other toad here who can basically instantly complete the game for you. Through this toad, you can save the game, give yourself a bunch of coins, add any party member to your team that you want instantly, he can give you the signal ring item, you can unlock the entire world map, and this toad can even take you right to the end of the game if you want. Honestly, a really nifty feature if you just want to explore the whole game with all of the characters quickly, or if you're making a YouTube video and you don't have time to play through the whole game to unlock all of those things. Anyways, going back to the test room here, although there is much more to it, the rest of the area is pretty empty with nothing else to offer. So yeah, the only notable part is found here with these toads. And we're not done with the debugging features, not by a long shot, as this game also has not one, not two, but three debug menus offering a whole wide range of debugging features for one to play around with. The first of these is a menu for debugging overworld stuff, and it can be enabled by entering an action replay code, and then, strangely enough, interacting with the lamp in Mario's room. Kinda cryptic, but also something I don't think we've ever seen on this series for accessing a debug menu, so I'll give it props. Anyways, in addition to allowing you to do stuff like give yourself 99 flowers or 500 coins, you can also give yourself one level up or max out your level, which will result in this nice sound. Oh, and then you'll also have to sit through a whole bunch of level up screens, so just be ready for that. And I guess this option is a bit misleading, as after one go through, I actually didn't get max level for a few characters. So I guess it may not max your level out, but it will give you a crap ton of XP nonetheless. And then, much like the debug room we went over earlier, here you can also warp to numerous sections of the game, including the Booster Chase segment, the Midas River Waterfall, Lands and Desert, and more. It's a super nifty menu for getting to certain parts of the game quickly without having to replay it all over again to get there. Next up, there are two menus that can be brought up in battle, the first of which deals with testing spell effects with three different options here. The first magic one here lets you test various spells that use translucency effects in the game. Laster, which is apparently supposed to be Raster, lets you mess around with an image of Big Boo. And then lastly is BG Laster, and this option lets you mess around with Boo again, this time by stretching and like rotating it around. And then last, but certainly not least for this video, the third debug menu left over in the game is also for the battles, and here we got much more stuff to play around with. We got stuff like being able to change the background of the fight you're in to any of the ones in the game, HP max, as it sounds, will refill your party's health, the music and SE options here act basically as sound test menus where you can listen to all of the game's music and sound effects respectively, then similarly, the OBJ option lets you flip through all of the game's sprites, including the unused ones that I was going over earlier. The line option here will bring up a flickering line on screen, big surprise. And this is actually a CPU usage meter, something that's basically become a staple on this series when we encounter these debug menus. Effect leads to another submenu testing various background animations that are used throughout the game, like Peach's Mute Balloon. EVTs 1 through 3 here will take you to either the first fight in the game to save Peach against Bowser, the fight against Boomer, or right up to the Smithy fight respectively. And then Test here will just show Smithy's transformation beam animation, after which the game will basically softlock as it won't let you do anything after it's done. But the best option on this menu in my opinion is the Scene option, which basically lets you go into any fight in the game. Any enemies, mix of enemies, bosses, pretty much if you can fight them in the game, they're accessible here. In fact, you can even load up some enemy formations that aren't normally encountered, like fighting the otherwise unused drill bit enemies that we discussed earlier. 
Overall, this menu is amazing for toying around with this game's battle mechanics. And my friends, we'll wrap it up there for Super Mario RPG here on Lost Bits, and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, check out some of my other Lost Bits videos, and be sure to subscribe to the channel to find your way back here in the future. Also, a shout out to my Epic channel members like Lieutenant Yellow and Lightkeeper98. If you'd like to help support the channel and become a member, check out the join button below. And as always, thank you all so much for stopping by today, and I will see you in a bit.